tonight, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to read the first six verses of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Timothy chapter 2 starting in verse 1. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. For kings 
for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Let's pray. Well, we praise you tonight for this chance to be in your house, Lord, thankful for uh, a Wednesday night. It's already been mentioned, thankful for this time for, for songs, for prayer, and for your word, and Lord, just to be able to get out of this crazy world that we live in and to be able to, Lord, have some peace and, and some comfort and some encouragement and some strength that we can draw from the Holy Spirit from, from your word. And we pray tonight that that's exactly what takes place. Bless us tonight in all that we do, Lord, that we may take it outside these walls and try to bring that peace and encouragement to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Paul writing to his son in the ministry, Timothy, uh, getting close to the end of his life, one of the last letters that we have uh, that Paul penned. And we get here to chapter 2, and he's talking about praying for folks. Uh, he says here, I, exert, I exhort, therefore, I encourage, I, I tell you, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm begging you to do this, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made. Boy, this is a tough one. For all men. Yeah. For all men. Yeah. Paul doesn't say for the folks you love, yeah. even though it's supposed to be all men. Yeah. Paul doesn't say for the folks that agree with you, for the folks that have the same ideas as you, for the folks that you like yeah. more than others. But he said for all men. And then he says this, for kings and for all that are in authority purpose-wise so that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. Timely verses for tonight as we look at, at where we're at. The situation that the world is in. The situation that our country is in. Uh, and I wonder tonight, do you find yourself much like I find myself uh, falling short of that verses 1 and 2. Because I, I don't pray for our leaders the way I should. Because I don't agree with our leaders. But that doesn't mean I don't pray for them. And I haven't prayed for them enough. Maybe that's why I don't agree with them. Maybe if I pray for them more, they do things I agree with. Maybe that'd be all of us. Uh, and then you look at, at what's going on in, in Israel and you, and, and in Gaza and all that's happening with Hamas and what's about to happen with Hezbollah and Iran getting involved and uh, there's not a quiet peaceful life over there but as Paul told Timothy we should be praying for that praying that things would work so that there would be a quiet and peaceable life and then he tells us there in verse 3 because this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior then verse 4 tells us who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth because that's really what we ought to be praying for all those folks. I, I feel in my heart, you say, well, preacher, you ain't supposed to judge, well, I ain't judging, but I feel like a lot of the folks that don't agree with what I agree with is the reason they don't agree with because they ain't saved. They need to be saved. We ought to be praying for their salvation, praying that they get saved, praying that they come to the knowledge of the truth. It's amazing to me to listen to pundits and listen to politicians and listen to people go on and on and on about all that's going on and not one of them seems to have an inkling that it's the Bible taking place in front of their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. And to me it's pretty clear that that's yeah. exactly what's happening. But you know, I guess it's not politically correct to talk about the Bible and talk about uh, the Lord because we're supposed to be all inclusive and, and everybody's supposed to be you know everybody's thoughts and everybody we're just going to accept them all but here's where Paul tells us that's not right in verse 5 he gives us that truth for there is one God what? Jehovah God right. we covered that in the very first 
beginning of when we did the word and of the one true God. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Go back to that verse 5. That's the one we want to center on tonight as we continue our study in what we believe. There's one God and one mediator between God and men. You've got your manual with you. We're still on page 10. We've just kind of gotten started in number 4 on of the way of salvation. A couple of weeks ago we covered, we believe that the salvation of sinners is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, of grace. And now we get to that second phrase. Through the mediatorial offices of the Son of God. Through the mediatorial offices of the Son of God. Mediatorial, being a mediator. To mediate. You look up a simple definition of mediate. To intervene between people in a dispute in order to bring about an agreement or a reconciliation. And so verse 5 tells us there's one God. We've already covered that back in our second article of faith, one true God. And then we've got man. We covered that in article 3, the fall of man. There's a big gap between God and man, and the, and the reason that gap's there is because of sin, because of the fall of man, because of what Adam did and passed on to all of us the nature of sin, we're all sinners. We sin because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We're born sinners. That's us. God hates sin. But he loves the sinner. And so there's got to be something that takes over there in between because as sinners, we can't stand before him. As sinners, we deserve death and eternal separation from him. But there has to be a mediator, someone who comes in between two people or two objects or two entities that are at odds with each other and brings them together. You got, you got uh, labor unions and, 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 and workers and, and owners and they can't come to an agreement on a contract and this is not going to work and that's not going to work. We're going to come to the table, we're going to bring a mediator in and we're going to get it settled. I spend almost all my day every day being a mediator between somebody. A teacher and a kid, a mama and a teacher, a daddy and me, always something. Got to mediate. Got to try to bring it together see if we can't come to some kind of conclusion where we can agree on something. Well, here's the problem. We can never get God to agree that sin is okay. We'll never convince God to say, well, hey, guess what? I've lived a pretty good life, and I've done enough good things to, to overrule the bad things, so let me just slip in, God. That's not the mediation that takes place. Because God's a just God. He's a true God, as we've already covered. And the only penalty for sin is death. We all deserve death. We should all get death. But the mediator can come in and reconcile us to the Lord through taking our place. Death is still the penalty. But Jesus Christ, the one mediator between God and men, comes in and dies for us and takes our place on the cross and therefore satisfies the penalty of death. And now God can look on us and count us as justified. Count us as not guilty. And allow us eternal life even though we don't deserve it. The mediator, Christ Jesus. It says there, I've always kind of liked it. The way Paul writes it and the way King James translates how Paul writes it. For there's one God and one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. I was like, the man. Christ Jesus, he's the man. But... If you look in the original language, what it's really saying here is that it's Jesus Christ who was man, who came in the form of man. 
That's important because if he hadn't been all 100% man while at the same time being 100% God, he couldn't have taken our place. Right. It wouldn't have been any good for God to die for us. It had to be God who had become man to die for us. And we'll get to that more in just a second as we get deeper into number four here on our article of faith. But he's the mediator, the man, Christ Jesus, 100% man. I want to read a couple of uh, verses. Uh, can we go up there, guys, to Hebrews 8, 6? We're going to do a couple of Hebrews real quick. Hebrews 8, 6. The writer of Hebrews, again, we can argue about who wrote it. It really doesn't matter tonight who wrote it, but, but Paul wrote it. So, But Hebrews 8, verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. Because Hebrews is all about being better. And here we get a more excellent ministry. By how much also, this is talking about Christ, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So we get more excellent, better, and better. Jesus Christ, the mediator between God and man of the new covenant, the new testament in Jesus' blood, the new way. He is that mediator. Can we skip ahead now, guys, to Hebrews 9, 15? There's several verses in Hebrews. I'm just going to read these two. Hebrews 9, 15. And for this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Again, the mediator, the one who comes between two opposing parties, the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, and brings them together and reconciles that situation. Jesus Christ. Now, here's where, folks, don't like this. But let's lay the truth out there. Back to the text, it said there is how many gods? And how many mediators? There's just one mediator. If you remember, as we went and, and we just got out of this in Acts chapter 4, for there's none other name, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's one name. Jesus Christ. There's one mediator, Jesus Christ. Muhammad was not the mediator. Buddha was not the mediator. Your physician is not the mediator. Your counselor is not the mediator. Your president is not the mediator. Elvis Presley was not the mediator. He was the king, but he wasn't that king. There's one mediator. Only one. Jesus Christ. And so that's the mediatorial office that we get there in number four on the way of salvation. Well, let's go a little further there. It says that through the mediatorial offices of the Son of God, it says this, who by the appointment of the Father, by the appointment of the Father, because we know this, this is, a truth that we stand on and we believe. God's plan of salvation was set forth at the foundation of the world. God knew that man would need a mediator. He would need a sacrifice. He would need a substitute. So the plan was set from the beginning of time that his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, would come and die for our sins. Simple enough. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. gave. God gave. God gave and thank goodness he gave. It was his plan. He gave Jesus, his only begotten son, that whosoever believed him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave Jesus Christ as part of the main part of the plan of salvation. How about this one? Can we, guys, we'll go to Galatians 4. We're going to do 4 and 5. Verses 4 and 5 of Galatians 4. 
Again, we, we've been in Paul's later writings to Timothy, and I'll go all the way back to his first writing, which we believe to be the first letter that he penned to the churches in Galatia. And in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, To redeem them that were under the law. Oh, can we go four? Four, four, and then five. There we go. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. God sent forth his son. When? When the fullness of time was come. When it was right. When everything was perfect. When everything was laid out according to plan. When it was time, then God sent his son. His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, made of a woman, made under the law, and then verse 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So, he's appointed by the Father. This is part of the plan. We believe that to be essential to salvation. That God's plan all along was to give up His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. So, again, we have that it's the, he's a mediator and, and as an office of the Son of God, and he's appointed by the Father. Now, we get this, okay? He's appointed by the Father. How many times did your Father appoint you to do something you didn't want to do it? Right? You, just because he appointed you to do it doesn't mean you wanted to do it. Sometimes you did, did it just so you wouldn't take that beating, right? So you weren't real happy about it. But notice what our next phrase in our uh, article number four says. Appointed, uh, appointment of the Father freely took upon him our nature. Freely took upon. Jesus took upon our sin and took our place freely. We've, we've preached this, we've told this, you've heard this all your life. At any point in time, he could have ended it. He said, they're not taking my life, I'm laying it down. At any point in time, he could say, that's it. I know that sorry Tommy Hannah, he ain't worth it, and there's going to be a bunch of folks like him, I just can't do it, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going home, I'm, I'm not going to do it. But he did, he freely took upon it. I think the best passage of scripture that, that covers that is Philippians 2. Guys, can we go to Philippians 2 and start in verse 5? Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. Paul says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 7 but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Let's stop right there for a second. So Jesus freely took upon himself our sinful nature. He was God. He was in heaven. He had everything. And yet, because it was God the Father's plan, he freely came to this earth, became a man, and lived a life as a man here on earth, knowing all along that the cross was coming. The cross wasn't a surprise to Jesus. What happens to him at the end of his life was not something that just popped up the week before. And he goes, well, I didn't realize this was going to happen. He knew all along. And yet he freely took upon himself as a servant to be obedient. Obedient to death. And then don't miss this part. Even the death of the cross. For a Jew, that's the worst death in the world. Humiliation. Painful. Top of all lists of the worst way you could die. And yet, Jesus took that. He took it upon himself and he went through the humiliation of the cross. He went through the pain of the cross and he died freely of his own volition 
all because he loved you and he loved me. And I don't know why he did. Well, I don't know why he loved me. I don't know about you. I don't know why he didn't love me. I don't know why he loved me. But he died on the cross of his own. Let's look at those last couple of verses now. Verse 9. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is what? Above every name. Because how many mediators are there? One. There's no name above his. He's the only one. Again, you just go through the list. Every name you can come up with is not above his name because there's no other mediator between him and between God and man other than Christ Jesus. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, verse 10, that at the name of, and here we go, Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and then verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. There's one mediator. There's one God. There's one human race man. There was only one mediator that could bring them together and reconcile them, and that is the man, Christ Jesus, who God sent but who also came on his own volition and accepted it all. Even though God sent him, he still accepted the fact that he would become man and he would die for us. Last thing that we'll cover tonight. Back to number four. So we believe that the salvation of sinners is holy of grace through the mediatorial offices of the Son of God, who by the appointment of the Father freely took upon him our nature. And then we get that last phrase. Yet without sin. Because he came and humbled himself and became obedient and became <laughs> man. I got a tick from that. Man. Fully God, fully man. But he came and became that. The only difference was he never sinned while he was man. And that is crucial. Because if Christ had ever committed one sin, then when he died on the cross, he would have only counted for himself. He couldn't take our place as a sinner. So all this stuff about, well, you know, Jesus was, he, he, you know, he was a good guy. He was a great, great prophet. But I mean, there's, you know, there's no way he lived without sin. Oh, yes, he did. He did live without sin. Matter of fact, let's look at just a couple of verses real quick. Can we go back, guys, to Hebrews 4? And we're going to look at 14 and 15. Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. People say, well, you know, he was God. So since he was God, he didn't sin. No, he was fully God. But again, he was fully man. And just because he was fully God didn't mean he wasn't fully man. And but the fact that he was fully man, he was tempted in all points like he went through the same temptation as you go through. He just never fell to it. People say, oh, but you know, he slung them things over in the temple. He forgot to turn them tables over. The Bible says you can be angry and sin not. No. He was angry and sin not. He didn't no. sin. Everything he did was perfectly right. Never one time. Can you imagine? You've sinned since we've sat in here. Yeah. You've sinned in the last couple of minutes. Just in your thoughts. And in 33 years of living on earth, Jesus Christ never sinned. Because if he had sinned, the cross would be for naught, and you and I would be hopeless. Headed to hell without an answer. But he was without sin. Let's do one more verse from that guys. Can we go to uh, 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Paul says, For he hath made him to be sin for us. Because he wasn't a sinner. But he became a sinner for us. Who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And now we get the greatest thing in the world when you want to start, start talking about grace and mercy. Jesus became sin for us that he might take our punishment of death. But boy, even better than that, because of that, we take on his righteousness and we stand before God as the Son of God. When God look, when we give our life to Christ and we get saved, God looks at us and he no longer sees us, the sinful person. He sees his son sinless and fit for eternal life in heaven. Thank you. He took my sin and I got to take his righteousness. He took off my garments of filth and I got to put on his kingly garments of righteousness. And because of that, I'm saved. Amen. And because of that, you're saved. Yeah. <laughs> he who knew no sin. So we finish up tonight. We'll just read it one more time. We believe that the salvation of sinners is holy of grace through the mediatorial offices of the Son of God, who by the appointment of the Father freely took upon him our nature, yet without <laughs> sin. And we can all say, Amen. 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 Let's stand. While Denise leads us in a verse of Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a